we're coming to you today from the White House. And, oh, man, my background. Okay, I'm not really at the White House, and I've never recorded there, but my guest has today on Live and Queer. Welcome to Live and Queer, QCC's Queer Art Show. I'm your host, Maya Chinchia, and with me today is comedian, writer, and podcaster, Zara Norbash. Zara is a queer, feminist, Muslim, Iranian-American, and I've heard she also sometimes goes by Daisy Duck. So color me intrigued. Let's bring her on and hear more about it. Welcome, Zara Norbash, everybody. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi, so good to see you. Salam, um, salam. Salam, chetori. Is that, oh my God. Is that, is that right? I'm is so right? impressed. <laughs> um, yes, I had a Persian roommate. So, you know, hey. we, you know, she taught me about, you know, like hairstyles and salons and how you how you uh, how you jump into the seats and all kinds of things uh, about Persian culture. And I taught her about uh, Guatemalan culture. And what's interesting is I think both of our dads are like they're they have the same sense of humor. So oh, I don't yeah. know if there's some sort of relationship between Guatemalans and totally and rad brown dad. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, before we go into uh, more about your work, let's take a look at some of your comedy. And I can't take this feeling anymore of not knowing, wondering any moment could be coming out time, any moment they could be coming at me. Is my mom going to cry? Is my dad going to yell? Are they going to kick me out of the house? I don't know. I don't know. Do I know who they are? And I'm sitting at the dinner table and I just come out in one sentence. On the podcast, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, I came out as bisexual, and I'm gay, queer, whatever you want to call it, and uh, Duncan knows, he's always known in there, now you know, and that's it. <laughs> you can be gay and Muslim. I am. My dad says, girls? <laughs> Women? Good luck. <laughs> My mom slaps him in the shoulder. She says, shut up. She says, oh my God, how many of your friends have you slept with? <laughs> Which was very hard for me because in my head, all of them. <laughs> then she introduces another version of hell I had not anticipated. She takes out her Facebook and goes to our mutual friends and asks me which ones I find attractive which is very difficult for me because all of them. <laughs> and they're making jokes back and forth and I say, I hate you guys. I know this is funny to you, but it's not so simple. A lot of people are saying you can't be gay and Muslim and my mom, her eyes boomerang out her head and back into their sockets. And she said, oh God. Nothing gets between you and Allah. Remember that. Moses parted the Red Sea. Jesus walked on water. But Allah gave an illiterate orphaned boy a book and said, read. Because self-discovery makes a prophet, not a bunch of self-righteous jerks. And then she said, and pussy is pussy. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means grammatically. One pussy is a metaphor for the other. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means, mom. I don't know what that means. My dad says, yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Pussy is pussy. My dad says, everybody has an outlet, man. Pussy is pussy. Everybody has an outlet, man. I think that's a roomy poem. (laughs) 
Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Tell me more about it. I mean, that that's a great story. You know, I think we have all these expectations of or especially in mainstream media, what that experience is going to be like. So um, that was super fun. Oh, my God. That it, it was such a gorgeous show. I had a gorgeous audience there. Um, it was in San Francisco. We drew 700 folks to the Brava Theater for a weekend of sold out oh, performances. Wow. Yeah. And it was just mm -hmm. To, it's just so magical to be able to do the kind of stand-up that I love, that walks the lines of um, drama and comedy, that walks lines of tension, that, um, you know, uh, goes directions that you don't expect. Yes. Um, and especially, you know, um, parents that you don't expect to hear from. I absolutely love that twist because, you know, I mean, parents are complicated but they're they're real and you know and it doesn't always have to be this like either or black or white experience and so I think it's really it's like we've been maybe holding all of that up inside about what what we need to tell them and our fears are yeah. all there <laughs> and then they just make a joke or you know or they're just they're complex themselves we don't know what their experiences have been we didn't even give them a chance until that moment right right uh -huh. and it meant so much to have um, the support of the folks at Brava Theater and with Golden Thread, um, the production crew, and Lisa Marie Rollins, who directed the oh, live performance. Love yeah. Her. Yeah, because uh -huh. um, there was, I struggled so much with, am I enough to represent? Mm. Am I enough to represent? And oh, that's God. why, yeah, that's why I did on behalf of all Muslims, you know, because. <laughs> right. I, I feel like we're always tasked with representation, even when mm. we're not representing. That's a form Absolutely. of representation. It's such a trap, whether you yes. want to or not. Right. So yeah. um, to be able to share this small story um, and have a big impact with it, the essay that it's based on reached 80 million people worldwide. Oh, wow. Is that is that the one where you like, basically shut down this yeah. magazine's website? <laughs> it crashed. Oh, it crashed. It totally crashed. It crashed three it times. Crashed. Yeah. The the okay. site, the site link. Um, uh -huh. And it, it was just a phenomenal experience. And I, like. The, it was it was just such a gorgeous time for me. I mean, I was so nervous uh, about, yeah. yeah, being token and representing mm, all right. Muslim queerness, you know, um, and I just got so many emojis of love oh, and emojis. sweetness. Yeah. I, I, don't emojis just fix everything? <laughs> yeah, they do. Absolutely. And that, yeah, that's so great. And that whole having to represent for everybody, God, what so much pressure we put because sometimes it's just we only uh, are allowed in mainstream society one voice of, you know, of a person of color or from any uh, community that's marginalized. So, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that we get to also process our own feelings through <laughs> through comedy, too. <laughs> comedy so healing. Yes. Um, well, cool. So you've done so many fabulous things. I want to get into that. And one of them, I I heard you also, uh, what was it like to record at the White House? Oh, my God. So surreal. Uh-huh. Okay. We, yeah. We, it, that, that was all, that all happened because of uh, my Good Muslim, Bad Muslim podcast co-host, Taz Ahmed, who received a Champion of Change Award at the White House oh. and asked if we could record our episode there. Um, oh. oh my God. And it was just such a surreal experience to get to go. Like the audience was full of lawyers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're That's there to, you know, of course, make sure that we walk the right lines, you know? Uh, oh, I see. Okay. That's why they're lawyers. Not because they're interested <laughs> in, uh, the awards or yeah. Okay. Like a little of both. <laughs> a little of both. Okay. You know? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. They also love podcasts. I heard lawyers there was love that podcasts. too. Uh, I cannot confirm nor deny that they particularly asked to be there because they were fans of us. Mm. You never know. Yeah, I'm assuming. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, like the. And so this is the Obama White House, not the yeah. most recent. Okay, good. That that's a while fun. ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, a different United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, in some ways, the same. Hmm. Yeah. 
Hmm. Right. Just just a little bit smoother. <laughs> a little smoother, a little more organized. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we, we usually, on the podcast, we issue like fatwas and creeping sharias. And of course, okay. we couldn't, we couldn't right. issue a fatwa, you know. No, not that time. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been so wild because we were there in the room where they made decisions about the nuclear bomb. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's where you're recording. <laughs> what are we doing? Like, it was yeah. just so surreal. And uh -huh. and then we were also told that that was gonna, the room that we were in was going to be the stand in Oval Office room in the next presidency because they were finally going to renovate the Oval Office. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And at that time, we didn't know Trump was going to win. <laughs> but just Who in knew? case, just yeah. in case I rub my ass all over it, I just... Like, oh, oh, good. Okay. So you didn't have that pressure that you couldn't make a mess. You were just like, I just, you never yeah. know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. I mean, they knew who they invited because they've got a file on us. So... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. They're watching. And the lawyers were watching. I, I figured they'll stop me if I can't, you know. Right. Okay. I'm just going <laughs> to rub my tits all over this paneling. Because when else are you going to get to do that? Exactly. I'm so jealous. <laughs> you should definitely, I highly recommend if you're ever in the White House, rub your tits on the wood paneling. I will. I'm going to yeah. write that down. In my, <laughs> that's going in my notes, my journal today. Um, so I could relive this moment. Over and they'll, and over. they'll know what you're doing. Security there. They'll know. Oh, okay. Just All say, right, oh, yes. I'm rubbing my tits. And they'll be like, right, of course. Right. Yes. Okay. So you also currently work on uh, another podcast called Snap Judgment, yes. uh, which is so awesome. I listen to podcasts when I have to drive far places. And, you know, that's definitely one that's on a, a regular rotation. So tell me what that's like producing uh, oh for gosh. Snap Judgment. It is heaven. Oh. It is heaven. Oh my goodness. Like I can't even explain to be a freelance artist for 15 years mm. where I'm in the freelance world, you know, you have to like constantly build community. Mm. You, yes. you, right. And you have to nurture your community and it's so much self-driven resource management. Yes. That gets mm -hmm. so exhausting, so depleting. Um, and it's it's just so much work, you know, and to have a full time job with a 401k dad. What? I made it. What? Wow. <laughs> no. Yes. Every immigrant dad's dream. When I told my dad I was I had a 401k, he was more excited than when I went to the White House. <laughs> he was oh, like, yeah. What? Yes. I, and And it's like the same crew of folks. And everyone there is so passionate about other people's stories. You know, it's not just our own, like where yeah. we're having to, it's other people's stories that come our way from every walk of life. Yeah, from, and they're true stories, right? It, yeah, true first person narratives. And uh -huh. we, we also get to hear from like other folks within that narrative. You know, it's not just necessarily the one speaker. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's anything that enhances the telling and to have like, a full-time job 10 to 6 where like that's all we're dedicated to mm. it's, it's just so gorgeous yeah that sounds like so much fun I mean like what what drew you to it I mean I feel like there is a little bit of a relationship with comedians and podcasts um, yeah. maybe it's I don't know like you know more people to to hear your voice or or, or you're interested in storytelling so it's but it's different types of storytelling what's what's really unique about podcasting oh i think for one i think it's the how prolific they are mm. you know at snap judgment we're putting out stories every week oh, um, yeah yeah that we're working on sometimes for three to anywhere to, from three to eight months oh, um, okay yeah and so just like that regular output is mm -hmm. a draw and i think that's what drew me to comedy too is like in stand-up you're performing seven nights a week you know, yeah. and when you dip below five nights a week, people are like, oh, did you quit? Oh, <laughs> you're, you're not working hard enough. Yeah. I mean, if you're gone for a week, like, and you're like, oh, I was sick. People are like, oh, well, okay. You tried we, that. We thought you quit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, 
Couldn't and, hack it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of yeah. that. Uh-huh. So the, I, I, I love the athletic experience of performance, of, of artistry. I, I love that we're always showing up even when we're not ready. That's my favorite. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the raw work. I love process and, and I love messy performances. I love figuring out what it is that I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So there's, there's like, I love the idea of having to, you know, the improv of, of live performance and then being able to work with a team and, uh, you know, health insurance and a 401k. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> maybe all of our art would be a little bit better if we had some of that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So a few years ago, um, you did like some one minute story videos on YouTube. I feel like you kind of predated this trend of like reels and TikToks and all these shorts, like you were ahead of the curve. I started it. Yeah. I, I, that's what I wanted to know. I wanted to ask the hard hitting questions. Um, but yeah, like how does the process differ between like doing one minute videos, 45 minute podcasts, live shows. Do you have a preference? Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think of it? Like, yeah, what was, what got you started on those one minute videos? I actually started it as a Ramadan experiment because um, I don't fast. Okay. I don't fast. I come from a history of disordered eating. I struggled with Mm -hmm. orthorexia a little while after my brother had cancer. Um, Okay. Yeah. He's in remission now. He's doing great. Knock on wood. Um, Yeah. But so it's very triggering for me, Ramadan time where we're fasting. Um, And so I wanted to play with ways that I could participate, um, you know, in the Ramadan is this time of like curated challenge and and self-discipline. And um, when I'm not participating in Ramadan, somehow I feel so disconnected from community Mm. and that already is hard for me as a person that is um, at the intersections of so many communities. I'm often yeah. in that little Venn diagram sliver <laughs> of a limited existence in community. Mm, um, yeah. I, I'm always on the fringe of yeah. some something about me intersects in a way that creates a contradiction in one of my other communities. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I wish I could be one of those people that just is like, oh, love community. I always feel welcome and I'm always in it. Like here I am, Aww. cis hetero life dominant narrative existence. <laughs> but, I know. You know. Yeah. And you could also be somewhat, you know, marginalized from any of those communities. Right. The community sometimes it's not even that welcoming of, you know, bisexual, pansexual experiences. So, man, you get it from all sides. <laughs> and and not in the hot way. Right. Not in the Ooh. sexy way. <laughs> I mean, you know, yes, after this show, I'm sure all things are going to change for you. <laughs> but yeah, so you have this you determination to practice yeah. this, uh, these videos. And yeah, you you yeah. got a lot of good stories um, out of that. Yeah, in in uh, my neurodivergent life, uh, as an ADHD person before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's totally cool now. <laughs> I I'm very like, phys- I'm a physical learner. Like I have to do it to understand what yeah. is this medium and how does it operate? Mm-hmm. And so I just dove in and did these one minute videos. And I, I have such a hard time with video because there's no audience. Mm, yes. And right. I really vibe off the audience. A lot of folks don't realize that ADHD, it's not about the deadline. It's about the relationship at that deadline where relational learners. Yeah. And Uh not having audience feedback on the regular after being on the road all the time and being used to that, I gave myself this task of doing these one minute videos for Ramadan. Okay, that's awesome. And then I think was it in one of them, you talk about your name and how it's mispronounced and (laughs) how you I don't know something about Daisy Duck. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what that's such a deep cut. I'm like, how did that even go? We do the research here on this show. Like <laughs> we know, we go in. <laughs> this is this is deeper research than the White House, folks. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it research, cheese man, gossip, it's all the same to me. But but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I totally identify with that of like that idea of, you know, my last name has always been mispronounced my entire life. My dad was always like, you correct people because your grandmother needs to recognize you when you get famous, you know, so no pressure. Oh, nice. But, Right. But I mean, I, I can imagine, you know, I was telling you, I sometimes Spanishize all names and sometimes that works for folks who don't have, you know, like Jane Smith kind of names. Right. And sometimes not. But but that is part of your life struggle. So, yeah, when I was a kid, I remember the Daisy Duck comes from just like always looking for other names that seemed more normal because people mm. were constantly stumbling on my name. And it's not that that bothered me but it's that it it automatically created a uh, uh, tension between us they would get mad at me mm. that oh, for correcting them right well no like not even necessarily correcting them just i don't know how to do a thing and i hold you responsible little kid <laughs> oh my god oh my god so much right? pressure yeah ah, so much pressure and i grew up in the 80s post iranian hostage crisis so then they, yeah. there. It always came with questions. Yeah. Where are you from? Where's your name from? Why are you named oh, this? What does it mean? Where are your parents from? How did they get here? How do they feel about the Shah? How do they feel about Reagan? It was like I'm right. five. Yeah, exactly. Can you be trusted, five year old? Yeah. Right. No. Right. Oh and my god. So I, I think it's like, yeah. I think it was like hearkening to my young budding queerness that I reached mm. for Daisy Duck because I think, as a little kid, I was just always obsessed with partnering. Okay. Uh huh. I was always paying attention to how people partnered. And I think it just confused me so much because as a budding bi pan queer person, mm -hmm. I, I was like, how, do, yeah. well, how does this work for me? And she was the sexy yeah. duck. <laughs> yeah, totally sexy and, duck. Right. And she had an edge and she was like, she wasn't like Minnie Mouse. You know what I mean? She wasn't all like, mm, oh, that's here true. I am fitting in boxes. I never thought about that. Yeah, she, yeah, she kind of went, they both would kind of go off on each other, the little ducky, right? You know? They'd get their fe feathers really ruffled. Um, but yes. Yeah. And I always but, felt like Daisy was kind of hitting on Minnie a little bit. Hmm. I see that. I see that subtext. Right? Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go back now. I feel <laughs> like it's all there in all of the cartoons. Okay, so that's so did they actually call you that or you were just like trying to figure out one thing how to be called differently so that you wouldn't have to have that experience pretty much the latter i i was yeah. <laughs> i was always like how do i make this easy right yeah, yeah everybody knows daisy duck i'll just name myself daisy duck right yes it didn't, it didn't work out and the alliteration and everything yeah i think i had like the opposite experience where i was in a spanish class and and like all the white people were choosing like latino or spanish names oh that's funny <laughs> yeah so i was like well maya that can be pronounced in any language but i want in on this too so i decided i would be called margarita you know margarita <laughs> oh, that's awesome because that's a drink i don't know I was, you were like yeah, I, was, I want to latinify my name even more Right, exactly. In a, in a white people way. <laughs> I want to join right. in on this appropriation. Exactly. Yes, all those that conflict, that inner turmoil as a kid, man, all the things we're expected to kind of understand and play with. But also, clearly, we have this wonderful, complex point of view um, yeah. that you channel into your comedy as well. And so, um, you know, I want to just I want to ask you, um, what is your favorite um, experience in in performing? Like, is it all a blur because there's so many? Or are there times where, where you know, somebody says something from the audience and you're able to turn it into something? Or does it, you know, or has there been crash and burn times? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, comedy just seems so fun and so terrifying. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I like it. I, I like that it's just um, you basically play with a scientific method of performance in comedy you know you try the same joke again and again and again and it's oh, okay. like oh is it the pause here is it this inflection is it this weird gesture you know um mm. what how do i play with this you know um and the, like paramount in comedy is the laugh yes that that's what decides if it's good you know um 
Absolutely. But that gets so tricky. Like I had this joke um, that I performed that always got a different response everywhere I went. Um, Uh, Really? (laughs) Yeah. How does that happen? (laughs) It goes, uh, you know, I have a white man. I own a white man by marriage. (laughs) Right. Okay. Mm, I'm very happy with him. He's adequate. (laughs) Yeah. It's a contract. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Adequate white guys are like the golden retrievers of the doggy kingdom. Just... (laughs) Hey, 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 I want to play. I want a friend. What are you? What are you? What are you? What are you? Token, 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 token. <laughs> Who was racist to you today? <laughs> oh, you got a good one. <laughs> got a good guy. And I train yeah. him. You got to train your white man. I train him. Yeah. <laughs> say, what do you do when it's time to step up, boy? <gasps> you step back. You step back. You step back. <laughs> Okay. No, you don't get a treat every time. But right. good job. Yeah, you don't get a cookie every time. You're just doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> wow. That's so funny. And I, I yeah. did that performance at this show in 2017 uh, at the YBCA. Uh, okay. The, you can check it out. It's online. Uh, and oh, good. Oh, man. It was just silence and so much tension. There were so many golden retrievers in the crowd just not having it. Like, <laughs> it was rough. Yeah. It was yeah. rough. And, like, um, they want to feel good. They yeah. want to feel like they're not the problem. <laughs> right. And it was like, it was like weeks after Trump's election. Oh, and then they're probably like, can I, can I actually laugh at something like this too? That, that night they were uh-huh. mad. They were oh, mad okay. at me. They were like, I'm trying so hard. <laughs> they were tired puppies. They were tired. They were working hard and they wanted a nap and a cookie. And they were so mad at me. And I mean, all the all the POCs in the crowd were like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like it's- after the show, you know, you did a good show. When <laughs> afterwards, Joey Soloway and Boots Riley approach you and are like, that was phenomenal. That was amazing. <laughs> like. Boots like quietly grabbed my elbow and was like, great joke. You know, (laughs) amazing. So tense. But then, you know, months later, I went to New York, did the same joke and killed. Went to L.A., did the same joke and killed. And wow, I figured out from that tension and from touring it how to kind of craft it so that even in San Francisco with a hardworking golden retriever liberals yeah it's hard being white hold the minute it's hard being white yeah Yeah. and caring struggle yeah it's hard it's a struggle yeah yeah struggle (laughs) yeah they they want to maybe a couple more cookies i think at the the beginning of training (laughs) you give them a lot more treats and then well that's that's what i learned to do for that joke was like how do i just get a couple more fun cookies in there to get them on board and get them playing and and i found it and it's so fun to tour (laughs) that joke now but that but that's what i love about stand-up and especially live stand-up is just it's so different every crowd it's always dynamic yeah absolutely and pushing at those buttons i mean sometimes we need (laughs) that release we really need that release because you know so much pressure to be good you (sighs) know or try to i mean but we need we need community. We need to talk about these things in all of the different ways, right? Either the heart, the mind, the gut, you know, from laughter. Word. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was so much fun talking with you, hearing your stories. Um, I am so excited to um, see what's coming next. Uh, thank you Yay. so much for being on the show today. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. So if you want to see Sarah's comedy, she'll be performing uh, March 8th for Sahio's International Women's Day fundraiser, a virtual performance. So you can visit her website at ZaraComedy.com or follow her at Zara Comedy on all the platforms. Links will be in the description. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe so that maybe one day we too can record an episode at the White House and just spread all our parts all over and let them know that we too were here. But I guess I'll have to for now, stick to a virtual background. (laughs) Okay, that's our show today. Uh, See you next time.
I'm Maya Chinchilla, and I approve this message.